So thank you so much. Um, I've had such a great visit here so far. And I think um, with Dr. Nakayama, before this, he was in Georgia. And there's nothing that compares to that southern hospitality. I think he's brought that up here to West Virginia. Let's see if I'm, if I'm smart enough to hook this thing on my, on my um, waistband. So um, I'm just going to hold this. My disclosure is I'm here to give you a talk on rural surgery, and I'm a colorectal surgeon from Chicago. So what does a colorectal surgeon from Chicago uh, know about rural surgery? Well, I do have a little bit of street credibility in that this is the view from our house in Driggs, Idaho. So this is a western view of the Tetons, and we live on the outs we have a house on the outskirts of a town of 1600. So at least I own property in a rural area. But I'll tell you a little bit about how I got started in this. This is a picture of a surgeon, Paul Nora. Paul Nora was a general surgeon, uh, lived for years in Chicago, and he was very active in the college. And um, at this, close to the end of his life, his family donated money to the college and started the Nora Institute for Surgical Patient Safety. And I got involved with Paul Nora. And there was an institute, but it didn't really have a clear agenda. We thought, what can we do with surgical patient safety? And at the American College of Surgeons, they've got this whole division run by Clifford Coe on um, patient safety, uh, uh, research, and optimal patient care. And I thought, there's this huge machine at the college focusing on patient safety. So what can this new little institute do? And while the um, college's main focus on patient safety had to do with NISQIP and addressing systems issues in the hospitals, I thought, maybe we can address the opposite end of the spectrum from the big hospitals, but the single surgeon out in solo practice or out in rural practice. And so that's how the idea came into mind. I wanted to do something different that wasn't being done. So what do I know about rural surgeons? Well, my assistant said, hey, there's this guy, Tyler Hughes, and he's a rural surgeon. Why don't you call up him? So this endeavor started with a single phone call to Tyler Hughes. He didn't know me from, from Adam or Eve. And um, I called him up and I said, Tyler, if the college were to do something for rural surgeons, what do you think that would be? And we got to talking and I asked him a little bit about what kind of cases he does. And then he invited me out to Cooperstown, New York, where they have this Mitthofer Center for Rural Surgery. And I went to um, a rural surgery symposium where I got to meet a lot of rural surgeons, understand some of the issues that they were dealing with and kind of asked around, what if the college could do something for the rural surgeons, what would that look like? Because I'm thinking, what can I as one person just starting do for the rural surgeons? And I'm going to take a step back and, and share a little bit what I did learn about rural surgery. So about 16% of the population lives in rural areas and only about 7% of general surgeons are practicing in rural areas. And most of the surgeons that are in rural practice are older and they're looking towards retirement. But the problem is they can't find anybody to come in and take their place. You've got residents coming out of residency. Um, a lot of them are going into specialization. And the scope of practice in rural surgery doesn't match what residents are really training um, in their residency programs. The rural surgeons have to do uh, procedures that fall under the umbrella of urology, ENT, orthopedics. And so there's concern that when, if you do find someone that's interested in pursuing a rural practice, they're just not prepared as much as they need to be. So there's a problem with rural surgery. And this is a picture of Welch, West Virginia, in McDowell County. And I was delighted when I was reading the New York Times on Sunday and there was a whole article about West Virginia. So I 
I got this picture. The American College of Surgeons um, Health Policy Research Institute has mapped out the surgical workforce. And they've, this shows all the um, states. And you can see West Virginia doesn't look so bad. But when you take a closer look, these are all the counties in West Virginia. And those red counties have no surgeons. And right down here at the southernmost tip, this is McDowell County. No surgeons. So why do residents, why do we want people go into rural practice? Well, I got this beautiful book last night. And I was delighted. I went home and I loved these pictures. So I picked some of my favorite pictures out of this book. Before I um, started medical school, before I had a mortgage and before I had kids, I was really into rock climbing. And so I, I pulled out this picture. So this is the incentive. This is one of the reasons why people go into rural practice. But what are the barriers? I mentioned the issues with training. There's this sense of professional isolation. If you're in a solo practice, you're it. And that can be um, stressful. If you have a difficult case, you have nobody to run it by. And sometimes you just like to share the stress or decompress to your colleagues, and you don't have colleagues like that. A lot of these surgeons are on call 24-7. And if you're lucky enough to have a one or two partners, you're on call every other night or maybe every third night. And a lot of the challenges have to do with the hospital infrastructure. You may have feel like you've done all this training and you're able to do these cases, but if you don't have a, a hospital that can support that, you're really narrowed in your scope of practice. We talked about last night a patient being transferred in that needed a splenectomy. It's not that the surgeon wasn't uh, capable of doing the splenectomy, but the hospital didn't have the blood bank resources for that. On the flip side, sometimes you'll have hospital administrators saying, we want you to be doing more surgery, because the surgery generates revenue for the hospital. And that um, this, the rural surgeon is critical to the success of a hospital, which in, and having a hospital is important to the entire community and the jobs that that hospital can bring. So really, the, um, the surgeon is so important. But if you have these hospital administrators saying, we want you to be doing more and more cases, and you don't have the infrastructure to take care of the patients uh, postoperatively, then that can be a problem. So the um, American College of Surgeons decided they really wanted to um, put more resources and focus on some of the issues facing the rural surgeons. Uh, and so they developed this advisory council on rural surgery. They wanted to better understand what are the challenges that rural surgeons face. And we want to look at how can we better train individuals to go into rural practice. And what about after residency? So these, as new technologies come about, as um, changes in procedures, how does that surgeon that's out in solo practice stay up to date with new techniques? And you might say, well, they can just go to the, the meetings like everybody else. But when they leave, if, sometimes if they go to a meeting, they're leaving their practice uncovered. Um, it takes away, it's a lot of resources to go from one rural area to a big city. It can be a whole day of travel. And then how do we roll out some of these system-wide quality initiatives in rural areas that we have in the more urban areas? So to make it more succinct, um, one of the regents, Jim Elsey, came up with this motto. We need to recruit them, we need to train them, and support them. So how do we recruit them? One of the things that we can do is expose medical students to rural tracks and um, have residents get an opportunity to do electives in rural surgery. Because if you don't have any, if you haven't been to a rural area, then you don't really think about it. And you kind of have to get people to think about it um, if you want to try and get them to consider a rural practice. But I think this is one of the areas where the recruitment needs to start. This is Emily Short. She's a high school student in McDowell County. And she's in a special program 
for high school students called Upward Bound. Um, and it's a nationally, uh, federally funded, that gives these high school students the opportunity to take classes on Saturdays and go to summer school to help prepare them for going to college. Now she lives here with her grandparents and her grandfather's on disability and they live on $1,700 a month. And I don't know if Emily Short has ever considered being a surgeon. But one of the best predictors of who is going to go into rural practice is someone from a rural area. That's where they've been born and bred. That's what they know. And so I think we need to start by planting the seed and in some of these uh, kids that live in rural areas and give them a vision that they could become a surgeon. And I think this is where the recruitment can start. So how about training? There are certainly residency programs that have the opportunity for residents to rotate in rural areas. There's just a handful of them around the country. And so one of the things that we're looking at is how can we see, how can we take the models that have successfully incorporated these rural tracks or these rural um, electives and increase them into other residency programs so there's more opportunity for the residents. The other thing that the college has started is a transitions to practice um, program. And this is a post-residency fellowship, if you will, where the um, fellows can get more ex experience and more autonomous experience. They can sometimes increase the scope of what they're learning based on where they plan to practice. So if you are going into, you're looking forward and saying, well, I want to do this practice in a rural area, and I know that in that town, if, if um, there's going to be times when I'm having to cover C-sections and I haven't done a C-section before and so, and since I was a, you know, a medical student on the OB service. And so that would be an opportunity for you to get some extra experience. Um, you would be re able to work with some very uh, skilled surgeons and they would tailor the, the learning needs based on um, what your future plans are. When I gave this talk, um, a talk similar to this last year, there were five programs around the country doing this. This year, there's 14. So this is really taking off. And I think this is an um, opportunity f uh, for some of the uh, residents that want to just do bread and butter general surgery or a broad-based general surgery to get more of that training. I think that some of the residents don't feel completely confident um, to go from being in a residency where you've got so much protection and so much support to being completely on your own. And I think this is looked at as a stepping stone. So how about supporting them? We talked about recruitment. We talked about training. How do we support these um, surgeons once they're already in practice? And so this is one of the, uh, this is the course that I worked with David Borgstrom and Tyler Hughes in putting together. And when I went to um, Cooperstown and spoke to the rural surgeons, I learned that one of the challenges they face is access to continuing professional development, doing these postgraduate courses. And they wanted to be able to keep up on some of the uh, skills. So first of all, I started with, what do I need to teach in this course? And I asked them, the surgeons, what do you do? What would you like to learn? And who's going to cover for you? So these are some of the most common procedures that the rural surgeons reported doing. And look at this. The average years in practice was 18. So you can see a lot of these surgeons are very experienced, but they're not going to be in practice for that much longer. And it's a big question came up, what's going to happen when these surgeons retire? So we looked at the, well, the procedures I showed were the most common procedures that they performed. A lot of surgeons do other procedures that aren't typically under the umbrella of rural surgery, uh, general surgery. And we asked them, of these 
different topics, what would you be interested in? And these were some of the most uh, popular topics. I didn't know that people would be so interested in leadership and communication. I thought that would um, be something that people didn't appreciate, but that was actually the number two uh, rated topic after ultrasound. And so we developed learning modules for each of these skills. We, t um, we asked the surgeons, who will cover your practice while you're away? Some of them had partners. A lot of them had to reach out to a locum tenens. And then for some of them, their practice would go uncovered. For the curriculum in our first two courses, we covered these topics um, with the facial plastic surgery. We did lesion excision because we thought if you have some patient, like a farmer that has a little superficial spreading melanoma, they don't want to have to travel to um, the big city just to get this simple procedure. And then for the facial plastic surgery, we did um, eyelid repair, lip repair, and repair of a uh, cheek laceration. For the orthopedic surgery, we did management of the fingertip amputation. Um, this is something, a trauma that we would see commonly in uh, rural areas. And um, this is an example of the module that we did for the emergency urology and gynecology. We did um, ovarian torsion and ectopic pregnancy. For the urology module, we did suprapubic tube insertion and um, ureteral repair and testicular torsion. There was a discussion about how much we should teach these individuals in terms of urology. We thought about doing um, ureteral stent insertion and cystoscopy, and our urologists were concerned that trying to teach individuals to do urethral dilatation was too risky, and if they had a uh, urethral stricture, that we should just teach them to put in the suprapubic tube. But we're having urologists, some of the general surgeons are asking to teach at least the cystoscopy and the ureteral stent insertion, because if they have a difficult case like diverticulitis or something and they know that that ureter is going to be stuck down, they want to try and put the stent in um, and prevent, try and prevent a ureteral injury, uh, as opposed to learning how to just repair the ureteral injury. Um, so this, for the uh, gynecologic module, we created a pelvic model. And so they could do the laparoscopic approach to the ovarian torsion and to ectopic pregnancy. And when we did these courses, we brought in our experts in gynecology to mentor the trainees. So this is our ureteral repair module. And here's the, we developed this model for the suprapubic tube insertion. And this was um, these simple little trainee modules where we would take uh, plastic pelvis and cover it with this um, plastic covering and have a balloon in there, inside that represented the bladder so that the individuals could practice doing the uh, suprapubic tube insertion using this Seldinger technique. And these are simple things, but if you haven't, if you're out in practice and you haven't had the opportunity to come in and do this hands-on practice, um, you need to kind of go over that barrier. And then we did in situ simulation. We did, for our first course, we did a half day uh, session on leadership and communication. And then we ran these individuals through an endoscopy module where we took them through an uh, emergency and had them work on, we'd address some of these teamwork and communication issues and then we would debrief them. And here is uh, looking at our module on facial plastic surgery and this is one of our plastic surgeons. And when we did this first course, it was spectacular and it was spectacularly expensive. And we had uh, philanthropic funding for that, but the problem was the sustainability of this course 
for how expensive it could be. These cadaver heads are $1,000 each. And you can imagine, you can't, <laughs> if you have funding for a course, it's not going to go so far when you spend all your resources on the cadaver head. But it was a, a great um, training opportunity. And what we ended up doing is coming up with a model face that we use for teaching the subsequent um, portion of the course. So then we asked our uh, course participants what difference did they experience in their practice from taking this course. Because any time you do some teaching, you want to know, does it really make a difference? So we asked them, did this improve the quality of patient care? And this is, this is the results from two um, years. 89% mentioned that they did feel there was an improvement in the quality of patient care. And here's examples of some of the quotes that they put in, or that they, they gave us. Recognizing that communication is important for the team members. Um, in the endoscopy module, we taught endomucosal resection of polyps how to use clips for hemostasis, and how to use clips to repair defects in the mucosa after you do the polypectomy. Um, we taught individuals how to use ultrasound. We did a module on ultrasound for central line insertion and breast ultrasound. And there's a lot of strong evidence showing that you get better results when you use ultrasound for central line insertion. But I've got these surgeons that have been in practice for an average of 18 years and they've been putting in central lines all this time. And I thought they would not be so interested in using, in learning ultrasound for central line, because they're sort of experts at central line. But actually, they were quite, uh, they were more enthusiastic than I in expected in learning the um, ultrasound and being able to incorporate that into the practice and change their techniques. One of the biggest barriers that these surgeons face in incorporating ultrasound into their practice was that in these hospitals, you can bill for ultrasound, right? And that ultrasound is owned by the Department of Radiology. And so the Department of Radiology doesn't want to give up their ultrasound machines. So some of these surgeons, if they wanted to put in a central line, they would still have to call the ultrasound tech from radiology to come and actually do the ultrasound. So that's one of the uh, problems. And Nowadays, everybody's really ultrasound has become an extension of the physical exam in so many ways. Certainly, <coughs> ultrasound has become so much uh, more of the routine um, diagno di for diagnosis in breast disease. People are looking at it to look at things like pleural effusion in the ICU. And so it's an opportunity to get this ultrasound in the hands of the surgeons that weren't trained in using ultrasound. So I talked about the importance of supporting these rural surgeons by giving them opportunities to continue training after they're out of practice. And a second um, initiative with the Advisory Council has been the development of a listserv for the rural surgeons. And the goal with this was to really to try and reach out to the rural surgeons, try and engage them so that there's two-way communication and a better understanding of what the life and practices in rural areas. So we started this listserv, and it's moderated by Phil Carapresso. And they identified 1,700 surgeons by their zip codes. It's sometimes tricky to define who is a rural surgeon. And by the US Census, they define rurality based on the size of a town. If you have a town of 25,000 or less, that can be sort of a rural town. And then if it's less than 5,000, that's more of a frontier town. But it's a little bit tricky to, to pinpoint who is a rural surgeon. And we think some surgeons, if they feel like they're in a rural area, that's good, that's good enough. That counts. So this just started um, at the end of last year. And there were some hiccups. This is one day where in one day, 55,000 emails went out. And that filled up everybody's email box. So we had to work out some of the kinks, um, figuring out how you can um, have the messages be controlled, be secure, not go right into the spam folders. Um, these were some of the uh, problems. 
and they, people were concerned about the virus infection. But as of um, after a few months, there were over 500 emails exchanged, and there was just a lot of conversation. Um, and there was a wide range of topics that were covered. Uh, as of January, there's been over 2 million messages. And you can see that in the end of, by 2013, there was much more activity. And here is just some of the topics. And I know I've violated the PowerPoint rule, not too many bullet points. But I just, and, and I've even eliminated some of them, but this is the scope of topics that people are talking about. And it really helps you um, understand what is on people's mind. And I think this is a really exciting opportunity to look at what education is going to be like in the next decade. Um, up to now, the, some of the main opportunities for education have been clinical congress. And that's everybody you know, going to this one meeting, and there's all these societies, and people travel. And they think there's nothing that substitutes for that peer-to-peer -peer interaction, that face-to-face -face, um, building of camaraderie. But there's certainly an excellent opportunity to use this electronic platform and more social media for education. And what you see with this listserv is you see surgeons teaching each other. And I feel like this is what we're learning from the next generation, how to use this. Um, there's a lot of talk about laparoscopic common, I mean, about common bile duct exploration. And based on the, res, the input from this listserv, uh, last year we did a course on laparoscopic common bile duct exploration. And that was very popular. It sold out. I paired that with anesthesia because there was a lot of discussion on the listserv about anesthesia. In rural communities, they don't have anesthesiologists. All the anesthesia is done by the CRNAs. And so when we put together this module on anesthesia, I partnered with the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. And when I've done these skills courses, I've kind of tried to pair a really popular topic with a topic that I think might not be so popular, but is important from a patient safety aspect. And that was the result of the anesthesia module, is I think that people all wanted to sign up for the laparoscopic common bile doors. Um, bile duct course, um, and there's evidence to show that um, in a lot of these hospitals, they don't have access to ERCP. So if you get in the, to do a gallbladder and you see a stone in the common duct, your options are you know, to close and send the patient for ERCP or do an open common bile duct exploration, and this is giving them a second choice of doing the laparoscopic common bile duct exploration, um, which there's some studies have shown that the overall cost is less when you do the laparoscopic common bile duct exploration when you have to factor in um, having these patients get set up for a separate, separate procedure for ERCP. And so this gives those rural surgeons another option. Uh, there's a, some advocacy issues that some of um, uh, problems about the, the a rule where patients should be discharged from a critical access hospital after 96 hours. Um, and a real big issue for surgeons is call coverage. And it's just so sustained. And it's one thing being on call every other night when you're in your 20s and 30s. But when you've been practicing uh, for 18 plus years and you're in your 50s, you still don't, you don't have quite the energy. Um, so. I think that these rural surgeons have really loved the listserv and that they are meeting other rural surgeons. And we've been able to address somewhat that sense of isolation. There's dissemination of medical information. Now, I have to say that some of the medical information that is disseminated on the listserv isn't exactly evidence-based. And a lot of it is saying, I do it this way, and one surgeon doing, I, saying, I do it this way. So one of the things that we're looking at doing is taking this platform of the listserv and putting in sort of a more organized virtual journal club where we'll, we'll, uh, we'll find a topic and have some people bring up some articles so we can actually guide the conversation with some li uh, literature. Um, 
I think an, one of the issues that the college is working on to address the call problem is figuring out if we can get a, uh, organize a group of surgeons who are willing to go out to these rural communities and cover a practice for a weekend or for a week so those rural surgeons can get a respite. They can go on vacation. They can sometimes just take a break for a weekend so that they're not on call continuously because that is something that is one of the number one issues with quality of life in the rural area. And a lot of times now, if a rural surgeon goes on vacation, the hospitals will bring in a locums, a locum tendons surgeon to cover. There's a wide variety of skill sets with these locum surgeons, and some of them are not considered to be the highest quality. We thought if we can have a pool of surgeons that are available to cover, uh, that would be a benefit for the surgeons in rural practice. And this can also be a benefit uh, for surgeons that are maybe towards the end of their career and they don't want to work full time, but they'd like to go out and still do a little bit of practice. And what this brings us back to, um, to training. One group of, of individuals that we're focusing on training is the residents coming out of practice. But another group that we're looking at is what about someone who's been in an urban practice for a number of years and then they decide they want to move out to a rural area. And if they have to expand their scope of practice, how are they going to add those additional skills that they haven't done? I can see myself in a, you know, a few years. I say when my kids graduate from high school, I want to move, go back out to a rural area. My kids are six and eight, right? But I haven't done a lap coley since I finished my residency. So I would have to learn some new skills to go out into that rural area. So <clears throat> what else? We need to look at systems approaches to safety in rural areas. We need to identify what are the basic infrastructure needs for these rural hospitals. And the Veterans Administration has set an example of how this should be um, addressed in looking at for certain operations, this is the infrastructure that we need. And so we're looking at possibly duplicating that for the rural areas. Um, I talked about um, one, of the, well, one of the issues with these surgeons is when they get a difficult patient into their hospital, they often have trouble transferring this patient out. And so trying to streamline these referral patterns and have regional networks of the rural hospitals with the more centralized hospitals so that if you have a patient that meets a certain criteria, you can get this patient transferred and you don't have to call around to different hospitals. And this is what we learn by actually talking to the rural surgeons. Uh, one of the surgeons had a, a young patient come in with a uh, ruptured aortic aneurysm. And she had to call several hospitals before she found a hospital that would be willing to accept this critically ill patient. And then they have to work on how do we transport that patient? Do we have to use a helicopter? Do we have to fit, use a fixed wing? And what are those? Um, what are our options? And that should be something that's streamlined in a systematic way, not just figuring it out each time. And another exciting um, opportunity is what further research we can do to better understand the health care for patients in these rural areas. And Dr. Nakayama is leading this initiative for the Advisory Council, both understanding what the rural surgeons can do to improve their <coughs> practice and how does the systems of care affect the patient experience. We're looking at um, what is the cost to a patient for being transferred to a regional center. That seems like a good answer if you have a more complex case, just transfer the patient. But that means that patient is away from the support of their family. They have the cost of transportation. And then if their family members are going to go help that patient um, in the regional center, how much time do they have to take off work? What's the economic burden of that? Um, getting more data on what's the economic value of the surgeon to that community. And I think as we get more of this information, then we can turn around and say, listen, th this is why it's so important to have a s rural surgeon 
to support your community and get the communities to buy in and further support our efforts to um, educate, train, provide call coverage, all this infrastructure to help support the rural surgeons. I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions.